Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. You know, um, now that I told you to keep talking, I'm going to ask, uh, just let's take a moment of silence, of silent prayer or silent thought for the victims of the bombing in Boston and all of the victims of violence all over this world um, in the past months and the past year. And I'll bring you back when we're ready. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something entirely different and stand up for a moment. I'm not going to ask you to do jumping jacks or anything. <laughs> but, you know, um, I spoke with the faculty a few days ago, and I know that there are some faculty here today, and you're very, very welcome to be here, but I'm looking around, and this is mostly staff um, and mostly sisters. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit more with you in mind, but I wonder if you could just look around in the room and give yourselves a round of applause, because that's what this is about today. And my husband over there, too, I think, somewhere. Where is he? Where are you? Oh, oh, there he is. I thought I saw you, and then I couldn't find you. Okay, now you can sit down. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I say that to Ron all the time. I'm a saint. I have to work with Cal Mosley and, you know... Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, what you see here is really, it's, it's not going to be so much a state of the college, but the state of the college this year, but the state of the college in the last decade of its first century. And it was pretty hard for me to kind of knuckle down and say, you know, what do I want to tell people, what do I want to tell our community about the college in 2013, when in reality, with 2013 as the centennial, I have just had my head so much in all aspects of the college's past, its present, and its future. And it's really been impossible for me to, to think of this as a point in time that is disconnected from the past and disconnected um, from the future. And I've also had the opportunity, um, Annette Atkins, one of our faculty members, has been working on a book on the history of the college. So I've had the opportunity to read that, and I've been immersed in you know, the, the, the deep history and the accomplishments of the sisters and all of the staff and faculty and the alums and the presidents who went before me. So I really started to introspect a lot about my time at the college and not about what I accomplished but what the college has accomplished during the time when it was under my stewardship as a president and we've all accomplished this together and so I'm going to take you through a little bit some of the uh, different components of the college and, and talk about what's happened in the last decade because I think it's been a fairly remarkable decade and I've, I've also been reflecting um, on the great responsibility of being the president of the college during its centennial. I mean, that's only going to happen once in the history of the college. And the person who's charged with getting us started on the second, and, and being the longest serving lay president that the college has had. And the college has had an opportunity to have lay presidents for half of its history. Um, our, lay, our first lay president was Stan Azurda back in the late 60s and early 70s. So. I'm thinking a lot about responsibility and stewardship. What you see here, and um, I don't know if Kim will be annoyed with me because I'm previewing this a little bit, Kim Motes, but what you see down the bottom is, is a, a bit of our, cent our centennial logo that you're going to be seeing over the next year. And the theme of the centennial will be a century of connection. And it's about the connectedness that St. Ben's has had in this community throughout its sisters beginning 
throughout its cent th that was a Freudian slip um, throughout its history with the sisters and their first connection to our connections now and the connections that our students and our alums are going to have all over the world that little um, the logo with a kind of unusual 100 um, stands for one degree zero separation so if you can take that to mean that that degree is what the degree that one gets from St. Ben's is what binds us all together. So that's where that comes from. I'm going to start with a mini retrospective on finances, facilities, and fundraising because as a president, um, I've learned that this becomes so much a part of my stewardship. It's kind of like providing the undergirding or the food for everything else that we have to do that's related to our mission. And this is a little snapshot of where we are today and what we've accomplished together in that area in the last century. And it is by no means all-inclusive. It's what I could fit on one page of a PowerPoint slide. I think the most striking accomplishment that we've made together is that the endowment has passed the 50 million dollar mark in the past couple of weeks. So thank you for all your direct contributions to that and especially thank you for helping us manage a few frugal, frugal organization so that we can, um, we can begin to accomplish this. To put that into context, and I'll show you a picture, the endowment has gained more than half of its entirety in the last decade or one-tenth of the college's history. So let's hope that we're on a roll and we keep that going because this is important for our future. Our budgets have been balanced every year. Our audits have been clean. We completed an $82 million capital campaign in 2008. We're embarking on the silent phase of a campaign that will ultimately raise $125 million. We've created plans for all of the components of the college and its financial sustainability. We've increased annual giving dramatically over the past 10 years so that now each year in unrestricted scholarship giving and in restricted annual giving, we're raising about $3.1 million. That's in contrast to a little under a million dollars about 10 years ago. We had a bond rating upgrade during this time. We've expanded and renovated this building. We've built the Goretzky Center. We've built Centennial Commons. We've uh, built nice space for IT services and the health services here at St. Ben's and countless other projects that have really made us be able to focus more on our educational mission and the mission of serving our students. Here's a picture of what the endowment looks like over the past 10 years. So even after the kind of dip in the Great Recession, we caught up again and we're moving forward at a great clip. Yesterday notwithstanding, because that was not a good day for the stock market, but it's a little bit better today. We have some challenges in the financial area still, but they're challenges that we have a pretty good handle on, we know what they are, and we're, we know where they're headed. While the endowment has grown remarkably, it is still one of the lowest endowments. It's certainly the lowest of our peers. And for an institution of our stature and the, the type of institution, given the quality of our faculty, our staff, and our students, it is still very low. And that has to be a, a strong focus of the college moving forward in the beginning of the second century. Because if the institution doesn't have an endowment that will sustain it, then everything else will suffer. And for those of you who don't, you're kind of thinking, well, I sort of know what an endowment is, but I really don't know what an endowment is. An endowment is like your retirement fund. It's like what you have in the bank. But the difference is, is that it stays there in perpetuity, and we use the interest to support programming. And particularly, we use the interest for student scholarships almost exclusively, except when in the few cases where it's earmarked for something else. So that's very important. We have had a young physical plant during most of the history of the college, but gradually the physical plant is not going to be so young. So through a combination of um, reasons related to the aging of the physical plant, 
which is not a good thing because we're going to have to spend more in the future to keep it up, but in combination with something that is really a good thing, and this is a shout out to um, everyone who works in the facilities area on campus, we manage the physical plant in a very frugal and very careful way with extraordinary staff who are very committed. So it costs us less right now to run our physical plant than it does pretty much any of our peers, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. And we are using energy at a much lower rate than our peers, which is something that every single person on this campus is responsible for making happen in the way that you steward it and the way you translate that Benedictine value of stewardship into your daily life. And let me just show you those pictures for a minute, and I'll flip back. So. This is a picture of the investment of our peers on your left in their physical plant and the investment of St. Ben's on the physical plant, despite the fact that our overall physical plant scores very high compared to our peers, we're spending less to get there and we have to prepare to be able to spend more in the future. Here's our energy consumption. consumption. The one with the little blue arrow, that's St. Ben's compared to these other institutions that are our peer group based on their size and their geographic location. So thank you so much for helping us make the best use of our resources, both physical plant and everyone, um, in terms of the energy. Now one thing I said, uh, or I showed you on this first slide, is that we're putting in the, over the past five years, we've started putting more money away in preparation to be able to care for that physical plant. So at St. Ben's, when uh, Sue Palmer and I first started working together, and I largely credit Sue with this and her team, Ann Oberman, we decided that we were doing, we weren't approaching saving for capital spending very well. In other words, we were waiting till the end of the year and seeing if we had any money left, and then we would spend what we had. And so we averaged in new dollars each year. So at this point in fiscal year 2013, we're putting $1.1 million away towards that to be able to take care of our physical plant in the way that we can. So. Um, but there's other challenges that higher education faces. They're absolutely not unique to St. Ben's or to St. John's. But that there's something that we, we, we really have to keep our eye on. And one is the increasing competition for students, the increasing um, need for financial aid among our students, um, the more students we attract, uh, who are first generation students, the more students we attract nationally. We need to provide dollars to serve their need, but there's also competition for merit scholarships, as you probably know, from families who don't necessarily need the funds, but that merit scholarship is a marker to them of how much we value their daughter in the case of St. Ben's or their son in the case of St. John's. So that is becoming an increasing environment, and our admissions team is doing phenomenal work, increasing the diversity of the applicant pool that comes to St. Ben's and St. John's, increasing the geographic diversity, um, increasing the, the, the diversity of talents that our students bring, but that's in an increasingly competitive environment. And then another thing that, and this one kind of keeps me awake at night because to some degree it's completely outside of our control, and you're familiar with this, it's disruptive technologies. It's the notion of um, using primarily electronic means to teach very large number of students for free. And on the face of it, and these are MOOCs, you've heard of MOOCs, on the face of this, this is a very good thing. We want as many people all over the world to have as much knowledge as inexpensively as possible. But coming with that is a responsibility to figure out how best students learn and how we're going to maintain our model that we know that works of this close connection, high interaction with students, and all the incredible special programs that we have to get students off on a great start when they graduate. So we'll be hearing more and more about this last one and having to understand as a community more and more how we're going to respond to these challenges. But we have some incredible strengths here at St. Ben's. 
One is that we have a very experienced and dedicated staff. When you come here, you stay committed to this organization and you make it part of your life. And that I can't tell you what that has meant to me as a president to be able to know that I have um, the strength of commitment and the dedication and the work ethic behind St. Ben's that we have in our extraordinary staff. We have a great leadership team. Our, our group that sits around the cabinet table, we've been together by and large for a long time. We have a couple of people who arrived more recently, but they're part of the group, they're part of the team, they're extremely dedicated, and they want the best for St. Ben's. We have prudent financial management. When you compare St. Ben's against pretty much any other institution for what our outcomes are and what um, we offer to our students, we're basically unparalleled. And we're able to do that because of the commitment of the, the staff and the faculty who work here. And we're able to do it with salaries that are fair and increasing. And I know they're not, you know, they're not huge salaries, but we compete well with our peers in that arena. And, and that signifies the importance that our, co our work colleagues have to us and to this institution. And we use energy carefully, as I said, which means a lot on an annual basis. And our reputation is growing, thanks to the collective efforts of everyone in this room and the collective efforts of the faculty. So that's kind of the financial overview, the challenges and the strengths of where we are at the end of our first decade. Here's a little mini retrospective on what's happened in academic affairs. And Wow, this makes me tired when I actually think of it because so many people have contributed to so many of these things and they extend outside the realm of the faculty. Many of you in this room in an extended way are part of the academic affairs team and we have essentially changed the way in academic affairs that our students learn and we've extended the classroom not only in the great international programs that we have, but in the new Office of Experiential Learning and Community Engagement, in uh, an assessment and program review office that really helps us understand if we're doing what we say we're doing. Um, we're, we're bringing in a faculty that, our faculty has always been strong, but it's getting increasingly stronger and increasingly diverse in the talents that they bring. We've instituted a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, we're moving to the five-day schedule in the fall, which is, that was on my bucket list. I don't know. So thank you, Richard, for your work on that, which is exemplary. Um, and, and so many of these other things that are, are of great importance to helping us do our work better. And I know I'm singling some people out here and there. I can't possibly thank everyone. And if I, if I name a name, it just happens that that particular bit of work is salient, or I've been thinking about it now, but these thanks really go out to everyone. Here's a, a, a mini retrospective on what's happened in the area of students and enrollment and the opportunities available for students. And of course, they overlap greatly with what's happening in academic affairs because one of the things that we've done over the past 10 years is to really increase the partnership between student development and academic affairs and, and really look at the whole picture in terms of how we're helping students make their most of their time at St. Ben's. Some of the most important things from my view in terms of the students who come here is that we're more diverse than we've ever been. We had the entering class in 2004 was 4.6% American students of color at St. Ben's. The entering class at St. Ben's it, this year was 16%. Now, 52% of the babies being born in the United States today are of color. So 18 years from now, the population going to college will be 52% of color, and perhaps more, because immigration will likely increase, not decrease. So St. Ben's needs to be completely prepared to, uh, to embrace that population and make sure that we're ready. And it's going to take a long time, but we're well on our way to doing that. And we're on our way to having some new, unique conversations with students and faculty about how to best do that. Our students are more academically prepared than they ever were before. 
which really puts a hole in the notion that if you become more diverse, you will become less selective. It's simply not true, and I'm very proud of the fact that we've, we've proven that very much so at St. Ben's and St. John's. We have new programs, cohort programs for women in the sciences, which is something that St. Ben's should have been excelling in pretty much every aspect of its history. And, and we have at different points in time, but I think we took our eye off the ball a little bit there. And with the dedication of some great faculty, we are very much focused on serving women in the sciences. In student development, there's a wonderful four-year program built around the four-year residency that is developmental, that has a curriculum to it, that is well thought and professional. Institute for Women's Leadership. Um, and our students are starting to display some of the qualities that come out of some of these strengths in the Jackson Fellows Program. Um, we recently had, as you probably saw on the website, one of our students, Rachel Mullen, named as a Truman Scholar. This provides her with $30,000 graduate school scholarships, and she's one of only, I think, 64 students in the country to have achieved this honor. So this is most certainly a marker of Rachel's talents, but it's also a marker of the opportunities that she was provided here at St. Ben's. Um, did I say Phi Beta Kappa before? Because this is a big one for, um, personally for me, it was a dream I had coming to St. Ben's. And this is just a, a list of some of the honors and recognitions, most together with St. Ben's and St. John's, some with St. Ben's alone, that we have achieved together, collectively, everyone doing their part um, over the past 10 years. And uh, Rita Knesel, our Chief Academic Officer, will be named uh, Council on Independent Colleges Chief Academic Officer of the Year this fall. So here's my own goals for 2013, before I bring you a little bit into the centennial and the campaign. Um, you know, every year, just like every employee does here at St. Ben's, I go over my goals with my superiors, which are the Board of Trustees. So I look at whether I accomplished my goals the past year, I, I set my goals for the current year, and I also set my goals for a year moving forward. So there's all, and the, they're more refined as I get closer to that period. So this is for the current year that we're in, and the first one is an overly ambitious goal, but we wanted it that way because we wanted to really push us, and I'll talk a little bit more about the campaign in a minute. Um, but what we, so when I told you before that we raised about 3.1 million, and there is a shout out to Kim Motes, St. Ben's alum, and our Vice President of Institutional Advancement and her team, who have just, Kim's only been here for two years, they've hit the ground running, they've done an extraordinary job. And the 3.1 million that I told you about is what we bring in that's cash that immediately goes back into the budget. So this 13 million includes endowment, includes annual giving, it includes bequests, dollars that people have put in their will. So it's every kinds of fundraising that we can possibly do. The other thing that we're, we're very much working on at St. Ben's is to, in, to consolidate our long-term financial planning. So, you know, this overwhelming sense of responsibility at the cusp of our two centuries is to say, you know, we're not thinking about keeping St. Ben's healthy just for one year. We're saying, how do we keep St. Ben's financially healthy for the next 100 years? Now, when we long -term, do long-term planning, we're not planning for 100 years. We're only planning for five to seven years. But the notion around that is how do we keep increasing that foundation under us so that each time we plan for the next five years, we do have an eye a bit to the future. One of the things um, that we needed to do this year is complete our planning for the centennial because the centennial is going to kick off at commencement in a few short weeks and it can't come fast enough. Not for the centennial kickoff, but for commencement. I'm very ready. Um, to move into warmer weather and see flowers and things like that. 
Um, one of the things that I talk to the board about doing is working differently, and I mean that very personally for me, because now that we're undertaking this campaign, I have to be on the road a lot more, and I have to be singularly focused pretty much on raising resources for the college. So I'm going to need your understanding and tolerance with that, because I, I, you've seen it already, I'm sure, in the past year or so. I'm simply not on campus as much, because the, the job of building, raising funds and raising friends takes you off campus a lot. So sometimes you will see other people, especially the vice presidents, standing in for me in activities where you used to see me. That does not imply that I'm not interested. It means that I'm trying to do something else to further the college. We're trying to spread our talents around as much as possible. And then, of course, I will be the president, I think, historically, I haven't like done a spreadsheet on this, but I'm pretty sure that I'm the president that served with the most prioresses and presidents of St. John's. I'm on number seven partnership. So, you know, when the history looks back at the presidency at the end of the first century, one of the things that they'll see is that St. Ben's itself, the college, was in a period of leadership stability at a time when the, mo well, the monastery's leadership is very stable, but it changes on a regular cycle. And I happen to come in um, on the cusp of that um, in the beginning when Sister Ephraim was prioress and then spent six years with Sister Nancy and uh, great years with both of those prioresses. And now we have Sister Michaela, who is very fun to spend time with and work with as well. And I've had four St. John's presidents. And that's got to be some kind of a record for an unexpected one, too, um, for me. And so one of the things that I need to focus on is making sure that this relationship with President Hemeseth runs well and is smooth, and we're both very committed to that. But I wanted to get it in my goals so that the trustees and I could talk about this on a regular basis. And then everything else is advancing the goals of our strategic plan, which is called Strategic Directions 2015. So here's what the Centennial Campaign looks like. Um, the, the Centennial, the campaign is in what is called its silent phase, and it will be for a while. So you're seeing this, and I'm talking about the underpinnings of the campaign, but you're not going to see public billboards about this. You're not going to hear this on the radio. We're, we're working to get the campaign on firm footing financially, and it won't be very much toward the end of the campaign that it becomes announced publicly. But it's important that you see these goals, because the goals are directly tied to the strategic plan, and they're very directly tied to helping ensure the college moves forward strong into its second century. And the new academic building, for example, one of the main goals of that building, besides providing a home for the four departments that will be in there is to create an opportunity for our students to have a balanced educational experience both at St. Ben's and St. John's. Right now more of our faculty are still housed at St. John's and more of our student class hours are spent at St. John's. And that has changed actually much toward much balance over the past decade. But this building will be the, the um, final approach to make to creating that balance between the campuses. We always need scholarship dollars. We're going to continue to need scholarship dollars to support our students. At St. Ben's, we especially need annual fund dollars to help our students on an annual basis, but we also need to build the endowment for scholarship so that we can actually fund more of that scholarship from the interest on the endowment. Right now, we're funding our scholarships primarily through our regular annual operating budget. So the, to the extent that we're successful with our financial aid strategy, we actually have less money to spend on everything else. With the endowment increasing, we'll have more money to spend on both scholarship and other things. We have 15 million endowment dollars dedicated to centers of academic excellence. and. There are five potential centers of academic excellence, which I'm not going to talk at length about today because they only have so much time, but the centers house the kinds of activities like are housed in 
the Center for Global Education, for example. So they're a place in some cases, but not always a place. But they're an entity that actually enriches the academic life of the campus. And then a major expansion to the Hain Campus Center, but only phase one of that expansion is in this campaign. So what, what is a campaign and how does it work? And you always hear about this and you'll be hearing about St. John's going public with their campaign later on in this year. Our two institutions define campaign periods differently and we both define them differently than other institutions. Institutions choose how they define campaigns. So if you hear different things from St. Ben's and St. John's about how we went about this, there's, it's just a different approach that was defined at the two institutions. You don't, there's no need to assume that they're the same or that the approach is the same. So we started with the facilities master plan and the strategic master plan as the key before we even said, what are our campaign goals? We had to determine at the board level, when do we start counting for the campaign? So some institutions start counting everything they raised from the last campaign immediately when the last campaign is ended. We didn't do that at St. Ben, Ben's because for the past three years we've been raising money as we always have been, but we were raising it um, mostly for scholarship but not for particular campaign components. So we, start, we count our campaign from the date that we started raising for these particular campaign co components, and that was July 2011. I told you that we're in the silent phase. We have a consultant, and what that consultant does is they come and they look at all of your donors and your institution and the strength of your institution, and they basically help you make a judgment about the the size of your campaign and whether it's appropriate for where the institution is right now. In other words, are you likely to accomplish these goals? And we learned from the consultant that the right things seem to be in place structurally, the right donor base seems to be there, and from that we look at who are all these 30 some thousand people or more that could potentially help us in this campaign. And we start to sort them out about what their priorities would be and where they might like to help. So this is an onerous undertaking and we just finished a year last year that we call planning year that gets us prepared for this. And this year we have been creating a staff and a staff structure that is capable of helping us raise those dollars. Um, and we've developed a board committee uh, that is each focused, that is focused together on the whole campaign and we'll have separate committees that are focused on each of these components of the campaign. The campaign has an entire seven year time frame. So when you're in a campaign, the dollars don't come in all at once, they come in pretty much in a normally distributed fashion and so we're in year two of that seven year period right now to kind of give you a sense of where that is. Here's a picture of the new academic building that is um, basically fully designed in its grand scale and in the past you saw some partial pictures of this design. Here's a picture of what the inside will look like. Here's a picture of the nursing department renovation which is in the campaign and we've had quite a good year this year raising funds for this and we're, um, we have in development lingo, in fundraising lingo, we say we have the asks out, meaning we have asked people for the remaining dollars for this nursing renovation, and we're waiting to hear from them. And the nursing faculty and Carrie Braun have been um, really great in their support of this, and also the faculty in the four departments that will go into this academic building, and particularly Dr. Pam Bacon in psychology, have been playing leadership roles, not so much for the fundraising yet for this academic building, but getting prepared for us to raise funds for it. And then the Hain Campus Center, first phase of this, is an expansion and renovation essentially of the side of the Hain that faces toward the Benedict Art Center. And that'll really be the heart and the core of the building, and it'll include a new fitness center, it'll include uh, a a moved and expanded McGlynn's. It'll include um, offices for 
the coaching staff and places for our students, our athletes to congregate with coaches and some of our student development activities to take place in the Hain. And here's a kind of picture of what the entry level way to the campus center will look like. So those are the three uh, priority building projects. Now to close, I want to talk a little bit, and we'll have plenty of time for questions, I hope. I want to talk a little bit about the celebration goals for the centennial, because starting with commencement in a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating throughout the year for the centennial. And we're trying to be very planful for the centennial because it takes a lot of resources, and they need to be resources that will help propel the college into its next century. So the goals are to celebrate, to energize, to propel, to advance, and to strengthen. So everything that we're, you'll see happening in celebration over the next year, in some way, shape, or form, has the purpose of meeting one of these goals. And you'll start to see many, many um, examples of this beginning in the next few weeks. Here's a bit of a timeline, a, a very condensed timeline of the centennial. As I said, we're starting the celebration with commencement in a few weeks. We're celebrating for pretty much exactly a year until commencement 2014. This class that's graduating is the last class of the first century, and the class that's graduating next year is the first class of the second century. So we will make much of, of both of those events. The all-school reunion at the end of June will be a very exciting event where every Benny who ever has gone here is invited back. And we don't expect to have them all, but we expect to have a really huge full house, and the registrations for that are going exceedingly well. Um, there's a history book on the, there's a centennial history book written by Annette Atkins that will debut uh, sometime around reunion, and that is at the publisher slash printing press right now. There'll be centennial travel to four locations, and I want to highlight the travel to the Bahamas because this is the key, um, the key piece of the travel where St. Ben's alums from stateside will travel to meet our Bah Bahamian sisters, some of whom will actually come to Florida to get on the cruise with us, and we'll celebrate um, for a morning of mass and a lively brunch in the Bahamas. So we're very much looking forward to that. And the other three trips are educational trips that in some way are based on the St. Ben's and the St. Ben's and St. John's connections in, in these locations in the country. And two of them, Chile and Argentina and Greece and Rome, are led by St. Ben's St. John's faculty. And I'll be joining and leading the trip to Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. Student development. Mary Geller has been a very strong partner with Kim Motes in planning the centennial. And student development, fine arts programming, academic programming, academic speakers will all, or pretty much all, have a centennial theme this year. So what we've tried to do is take everything that we do on campus and rather than saying, let's create a new speaker series or let's create this new event, how can we take what we already do and we coined a term called, a verb called centennialize. So we are centennializing various things to help these events recognize the connections with the past and the connections with the future. And then on April 26, 2014, there'll be a gala in the Twin Cities at the depot. Everybody will be invited and that will be the, the final um, kind of capstone celebration of the centennial event. So I, I'm eager to welcome you all. I'm eager to, I hope you have fun. I hope you, it keeps you engaged in the life of the college and looking forward to the future. So I'm happy to answer any questions about anything. Thank you very, very much.